All right, everybody. Well, this is our um, upgrade preparation webinar. We're going to be doing a series of these with our upgrade team. This is the first one, STM and smokescreen testing. And we're really excited that you all are here. I'm Carolyn. I'm uh, going to be your moderator today. And I've got a whole group of experts here on the line with us as well. I've got our CRM upgrade team. You may have uh, spoken to these folks in the past. Michael Butler, Emily Carpenter, and Joseph Price, and also our uh, FTM customizations guru, Brandon Winchester, is on the line with us. Um, a couple of housekeeping things to cover before we get started. Um, I am going to keep the line open so that you can ask questions, so I won't be putting anybody on mute. Um, just be aware, though, that any discussions that you have will be heard by everybody, so you may want to consider putting yourself on mute from your side of things. Um, feel free to shoot me questions via chat as well. I'll do my best to keep up with those. Um, if I don't get a chance to address those questions during the session, I will create a Q&A type document to address those questions, um, and that will be sent out to everyone who's registered for the webinar after it's over. Um, as I mentioned already, I'm also going to be recording this session, and we will be uploading it to YouTube after the presentation um, so that you can view it, share it, whatever you want. Um, so when the webinar is over, I will be sending everybody an email with the PowerPoint slides, uh, the Q&A if there is any, and a link to the YouTube recording. So everything that you see here and hear here, you will be able to uh, get copies of later on. Okay. Just to go over our objectives quickly for this Carolyn? session. Yes. Yeah, when I go into the meeting, oh, now, mm -hmm. maybe it's, now maybe it's connecting correctly. Okay, great. You're able to see the presentation? I didn't the first time. Okay. Yeah, somebody else had that problem. Sorry about that. I'm glad it's working now. Everybody feel free to speak up if you have trouble hearing or seeing anything. Um, so our objectives for the session, really quickly, we're going to talk about what FTM is so that you guys are able to define and describe it. Um, and we're going to talk about what the impact of FTM is in any upgrades uh, that you go through to version 2.93 or higher. So this uh, session is specifically going to be for you guys that are still on versions 2.9 and 2.91, um, because what, the next time that you upgrade, you'll be looking at going through the uh, FTM change. Um, and then in addition to that, we're going to be talking about smokescreen testing, what it is, why it's important, when to do it. And we're going to talk about how your, your organizations can develop a smokescreen test plan that's specific to your organization. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. Hello, everybody. So briefly, we're going to talk about the financial transaction model. That's uh, referred to internally at Blackbot as FTM. You'll hear us use that abbreviation throughout the rest of the presentation. You'll also hear it as you go through your upgrades, the, the, the phrasing FTM. It stands for financial transaction model. And what that is at heart is a reorganization of the financial information and how we store that in the back end of our database. So that includes our, our general ledger information. It also includes revenue information. And you're not going to see, as an end user, you're not going to see necessarily any differences in the application and how users interact with that in terms of entering revenue or accessing that revenue. It's, it's a strictly a, a back end change. And it, it sets the stage long term for us to consistently apply um, information to accounting dollars, revenue dollars. We simplify that structure. We'll see that in, in just a moment how that looks. Uh, but this allows us to, to really give your CFOs and your accounting folks a much more linear view of that data and financial information. So you can kind of see this is, this is the current revenue model. It's, it's very star-based. We have a lot going on. There's a lot of tables. Uh, to get through information, we've got to go through multiple areas for revenue and for accounting dollars. So in our new structure, you can see much more linear. We've got a financial transaction that looks at a line item. That line item can be an adjustment. It can be an application. It can tie over to a single entity, or um, it can be a, a reversal. 
So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> and that ties through to a journal entry. So if we kind of think about, you know, what does this really mean for my database, at heart we're going from 18 tables down to five tables. So we're, we're really simplifying this revenue and financial structure and again making it much more linear, much easier to report on and surface a lot of information. So kind of an example of that is in the old model, the revenue model, we have the revenue table. Uh, conceptually, that's kind of being split into two. It's a financial transaction table um, that has information out of the revenue table that is applicable to all record types. And then we have a revenue extension table, which are things that are just specific to revenue transactions. So uh, another example of that, in the current model, we have the revenue split table. That's going to the financial transaction line item. Again, those are things that are consistent across all record, ty record types for a line item. And then we have the revenue split extension table. We've also got some financial ones. The revenue GL distribution table is going to journal entry, and so is GL transaction. So you can see we're, we're really simplifying the database structure for uh, reporting needs, for surfacing reversals and adjustments, makes all that process much easier and really sets the, the uh, foundation in our database for that information going forward to be surfaced much better, much faster, and much easier. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Michael Butler. I'm a member of the CRM support upgrade team uh, here at Black Bob. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about backward compatibility and how we maintained that with uh, the introduction of the financial transaction model. Um, basically, backwards compatibility is just ensuring that our current architecture is uh, the way that the data is stored is still, we're still able to get to it with our new architecture in the software. So no data, all the data that we have, we still have, we're just getting to it a little bit differently. And one of the, the ways that we did that was with uh, views within the software. What we have done is we have taken a lot of these tables um, that are now no longer exist, but we turn those into views. And what that means is you can still use the exact same code that references those older tables to pull the information now from the new tables that that data exists in. So you'll see in 2.9 and 2.9.1 here by our slide, the code is written to directly reference the revenue table, for instance, in our example. Um, and when you see that when we go to 293 or higher, we made a change that allows uh, uh, what, what happens here is our code still is referencing the revenue table, but since that table no longer exists and it's a view, we loop through the view to then pull that information from the tables that the data now resides in. So you'll see that the code references a revenue uh, column in the revenue table, well, it then reaches out to the financial transaction table where that data now resides, and then that, that returns to you in the front end. So there's, a, there's another piece of, uh, in the process here, and it's to loop through that view to get to your, your uh, data that's stored in the tables. So for our purposes, we're interested in how this affects our upgrade plans. And you know, by and large, we have developed this backwards compatibility to ensure that there's no breaking changes, right? You can upgrade to our new financial transaction model and everything that you have in place will work. Um, we have encountered some issues given the, the change in the structure um, where some uh, old customizations that may refer to, uh, as Brandon discussed, the old revenue model um, could be improved if they were updated to reference directly the new structure. Um, so. For upgrade purposes, we're interested in, in really evaluating the potential impact, you know, what, what changes uh, do we need to be aware of, um, both on the customization side and as just our general workflow is concerned. Um, so if we can get ahead of that before we really start the upgrade process, it's beneficial to identify those problems um, before they become key issues throughout the upgrade. Um, for, for many clients, this is, a, this is a pretty smooth process in terms of how long it takes to actually conduct this review and test these features. Um, depending on your degree of customization, what areas you have customized, 
Um, if you have any custom reporting that may be outside of BBCRM altogether, um, it can be more time and more involved, but um, that's why we're really trying to have this webinar today and get ahead of those potential issues uh, before, they're, before they're critical to a timeline or, or getting something uh, moved forward. Um, so as I kind of mentioned there, the issues that you're going to find are going to be really around this, this backwards compatibility. And it's not that things aren't going to work, but uh, you may find that because of kind of this intermediary step for backwards compatibility, uh, it, it makes sense from a, from a performance perspective to, to make some adjustments to where they reference the new structure. Um, we do have a lot of detailed information about changes to the tables, specific, uh, excuse me, specific fields, um, really extensive uh, developer level documentation. Um, there's, a, there's a link here in the slide show that we're going to be sending out um, as well as with some follow-up information. So if you, if you have the developers on your side who are um, really curious about, okay, what, what do I need to be mapping this old field to for new reports and if I have an old customization that may need some updates, this is a, a fantastic resource for um, just the nitty-gritty about how this structural change actually is carried out. So how can I prepare? Um, I kind of touched on the individual points there in the last slide, but um, we often get um, kind of feedback from clients that, hey, we're ready to start upgrading. Um, we're hoping to have our upgrade finished in three months. And what we're trying to do here with FGM is kind of set the stage that this is, this is a change that warrants kind of some preparatory testing. Um, and we're really kind of looking for people to, you know, spin up a test environment. This doesn't have to commit you to a version, to uh, to a timeline, but really just to be able to evaluate um, how everything interacts with this new structure. Um, as part of that, uh, we have an FCM kind of code utility. Uh, it's kind of a simple architecture, but it basically looks through your, your database, um, tries to find any, any customizations or, or code that may reference kind of this old revenue model. Um, so we can highlight those to you. Uh, Brandon will, will definitely help you with that process whenever you're ready to review those results or actually run that, um, run that utility. Uh, if you're on 2.9 or 2.9.1, you can actually run that before you spin up a uh, test environment. Um, so you can kind of begin evaluating those before you even embark on the upgrade. Um, as I said, we, we, uh, we want to understand what the results you're seeing. Um, if you have questions about them, our team, the support team, is, is all available to help with those questions. Um, specifically, FTM is a revenue um, change, so you're going to be most interested in testing those revenue processes that um, are, are typically unique to you. So if, if you have a kind of a custom import process or maybe some a unique implementation of some fields. Uh, those, those are all perfect areas to test as part of a very high level FTM testing. So what type of things might I run into? Um, there could be the potential for some out-of-box issues. We know that everyone uses um, different functionality just a little bit differently. Uh, if your particular usage uh, hasn't been as well used by other clients. Uh, we may find an area that, you know, has a has a unique impact to you that we haven't identified before. So uh, those are fewer and far between as we get in, now into our third FTM release with 3.0. Um, we have six service packs that have been released for 3.0, so we continue to identify and resolve those issues. Um, but again, we. Given the, the uniqueness of implementations for each client, there is a, a potential that you may find something we haven't seen the impact of yet. Um, so out-of-box issues you know, should really be treated like any other case. Um, please reach out to support. We'll evaluate that, determine um, you know, if it isn't a product issue that we need to involve our, the appropriate um, product development teams, that we can get that uh, on the on their radar so that they're evaluating that and testing it. Um, 
And again, this helps us to, to be sure that we can get a fix in place and get those resolved before your, you know, your end users are in their testing and, and we're worried about uh, meeting that kind of timeline. Um, customization issues, this is, this is one thing that the FTM utility will help you identify. Um, we've seen primary issues around that being, you know, changes in performance, uh, slowness. This is usually related to kind of large processes that may be um, really interacting with those, uh, that old revenue structure in, in a very complex way or in a, or in a, a large amount of data at once. Um, if, you're, if you're experiencing that issue, you know, feel free to reach out to um, our DSS team as you normally would or contact support and we can evaluate that to make sure that it's, it is a true customization issue or if we need to evaluate that from the product side, we'll do that as well. Um, our DSS team is available to, you know, kind of assist you with what that change might look like for your customization. Um, this isn't required for all, but you may find that there is some benefits to changing that, and we've, we've worked with other clients to show them, you know, how those changes can be implemented, and we'd be happy to do that for you as well. So, in summary, we're able to help point out to you what areas there may be problems with, but what you're really going to have to do is get into your database and test your processes to see where there may be issues. And once those have been identified, we'll be able to help you work with you to resolve those problems. Okay, so that is our kind of high-level overview of FTM. Does anybody have questions before we move on to smokescreen testing? I know that's a lot of information to absorb. Hi, uh, Caroline. This is Ellie from Boston University. I have a question. Sure. Um, it's actually a two-part question. Uh, have you done any benchmark testing? Do you have any vague idea as to what the exact performance hit is uh, in using the revenue views um, from the old revenue structure to the revenue view structure? Is it, do, do select statements take twice as long, three times as long? Um, or have you done any benchmarking like that? This is, oh, this is Brandon. I, I think I can answer that for you, which is, it really depends on your SQL. Um, so just depending on the structure of what it is you're trying to pull, the fields you're using in your where clause, in your joins, all that has an effect on, on the performance. So in its sort of simplest, if you were simply to do select star from dbo.revenue where id equals and then put in some kind of GUID, um, the revenue views will, will perform pretty much at the same level that, that the previous ones were, for, uh, generally speaking. Right, you're, you're hitting an index field, you're not doing any joins, and, and so on. You'll, you'll see similar performance to what you would have previously. If you've got a much, much more complicated SQL statement where you're joining against non-index fields, those index fields are coming from a multiple join inside of the view, um, all of that will impact performance negatively. So it, it really, really just depends on what that SQL is. That's primarily what we've seen is it just really goes across the board. Um, we've had a couple of clients who have upgraded and their BI solution um, still used the revenue views, and for some of them, um, they performed about what they were expecting. Others, um, it performed worse. So it, again, it, it's pretty much across the board in terms of what kind of results you're going to get, really just dependent on your SQL. Does that help, Ellie? Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have questions? All right. Well, please, if you do uh, have have other things that you think of, feel free to IM me in the in the chat window for the the session, and I'll make sure that we get those questions addressed. So, moving on to smokescreen testing, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Emily. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Emily Carpenter. I'm a project manager and support for CRM upgrades. And as Carolyn said, I'm going to talk about smoke screen testing and how it relates to upgrades. Um, so smoke screen testing, what is it? Um, smoke screen tests are quick tests used to validate the upgraded environment. Um, they're also called sanity checks by some people um, in that you would cover your most important functionality of a system to continue with the upgrade. To 
determine what smoke screen testing should focus on, a lot of clients ask themselves, why am I upgrading? Um, you want to look at your goals, your end goals. Um, one client's answer may be to utilize web shell functionality, um, in which case the smoke screen testing would focus on customizations and any areas that uh, most function on web shell. Um, another client may be looking to improve performance. Um, so we would suggest to um, focus their smoke screen testing on reports and queries and revenue batches. So why do it? Um, performing smoke screen testing gives your organization time to identify and to fix major issues before the end users get in to do their testing. Um, it minimizes risks of identifying major issues later in the project with end users or post go, go live. And any, fish, any issues found during smoke screen testing um, may need to go through product development for resolution. So doing this early helps identify and resolve those areas. Um, also customization issues will need to be addressed either by your team or um, by Blackboard. So identifying these early is recommended to ensure that the resources can complete those fixes in time. So when to do it. Um, smoke screen testing should be done if you're even thinking about an upgrade. As soon as the decision is made to upgrade and you have an environment ready, you can jump in and start testing your critical processes. Um, it always precedes actual end-to-end -end testing. So as you can see in that timeline, um, this is just a base um, sample project um, timeline that we created. Um, you'd want to spend a few weeks on testing, um, keeping in mind that turnaround time can vary for bug fixes from PD, um, service pack release dates, and the criticality of the issue. Uh, some fixes may carry a longer SLA if they're required to go through PD, as we mentioned, while other fixes like customizations or data can sometimes be addressed more quickly. And how do I do it? Um, so when determining smoke screen testing areas for your organization, it's helpful to ask yourself the following questions. Um, ask yourself, what are the most important processes that you run? Uh, what are the processes that need to be run every day? Um, you'll want to identify customizations you have you have and run through those to ensure that they function as expected. And something to consider is to let your end users in early and poke around and let them try out their own tasks. Um, they are likely your such subject matter experts and they can provide quick insight into what is most important to test. Um, so before handing it back to Carolyn, um, we would like to invite folks listening to share what what areas you might um, have in mind for smoke screen testing. I think each organization's priorities are a little bit different, but I think sharing yours might spark an idea for another. Um, if you'd like to speak up on the phone or throw that into the chat, we can we can look at those together. So, what kinds of areas would you guys think of as as kind of those key? places where you might run a smoke screen test when you're thinking about upgrading? Um, this is Ellie again. I, I can go. Um, we, uh, we actually started down this path. We, we started smoke screening our executive report suites. Um, these are the reports that the executives use to guide the, the ship, so to speak. Also, uh, batch entry, uh, data export, data import, end-to-end -end testing of certain business processes. Good call. Those are all really good examples. Thanks, Sally. Overnight smart field refreshes, global changes, things like that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's really a matter of thinking about what your organization can't do without. It sounds like you've, you've done that. Those are really good examples. Thank you. Does anybody have any others they'd like to share?
Okay. Well, it may be a matter of just, just taking a moment, stepping back, and, and thinking about what those kind of mission-critical processes are um, and building out that plan. So just to recap, um, even if you're not ready to actually sit down and plan out deadlines for an upgrade yet, we really want to encourage you to take some early steps that are going to make things easier for you later on. Get an environment upgraded. This whole team here on the line with me can help with that. Um, if you need help creating that environment, getting it upgraded, getting it set up, um, we can help you run the FTM utility. That's going to help give you a kind of a list of, of areas in the system where you might want to check to see if there is a performance hit, or maybe there isn't. Maybe everything's good to go. Um, but that utility will help, and we can, we can assist you in running that and discussing the results um, and helping get you pointed in the right direction. And at the same time, start thinking about other smokescreen tests that are important specifically for your organization. Write them out, test them out, get users involved. Um, just start doing that preliminary testing to feel out your upgrade. So um, just while I'm thinking of that, as I said, we really we want you we want your upgrade to go as smoothly as possible. We we really want you guys to test early and thoroughly. Um, I just got a question come into the chat. Where do we get the FTM utility? That's something that we can provide for you. Um, if that's something that you're interested in receiving, um, contact your TAM and they will help you get in touch with the correct people and get that process going. They are your first point of contact. All right, so just in summary, we're going to be publishing this recording to YouTube. I'll be sending everybody who's here today a recording of the webinar, the PowerPoint, and our Q&A. Um, and I'll also be posting this information on the Blackboard Know-How blog and the CRM Resource Center. So does anybody have any questions? That's all we've got for you. Do you feel like this was a helpful rundown? Does it give you a little bit more of the backstory behind FTM and, and where to go from here in terms of thinking about an upgrade? It's fairly general, but you know, some good information. It's, um, yeah, you know, we, we talked a lot about that. And the, the thing with FTM is that it is at this point, very specific to your organization. A lot of the, um, the broader issues have already been addressed at this point, fortunately, because we're, what, three versions past version 2.93. So it's, it's not, for you guys, it's not going to be as, as huge of a hurdle to overcome as it may have been for somebody, you know, two years ago who was upgrading to 2.9.3. It's going to be those, those customizations and those, those nuances that are specific to your organization. Um, and we really just kind of wanted to explain it on a, on a conceptual level in the hopes that it will inspire you to, to get in and do some of that testing because it is really going to be specific to what your organization does. And we are happy to go into as much detail as you want. Um, contact your TAM if you get an upgraded environment um, and have issues, create those support cases. We will go into all the detail that you need. We are, we are here for you and we really just want to make sure that, that things go as smoothly as possible for you when you upgrade. It's a long answer. <laughs> Uh, this is Elliot BU again. Uh, one giant gray area for us, one area of risk, <clears throat> as far as I can assess, that is difficult for us to gauge at this point is, so we have 100, we have almost 170 customizations in BBEC. 95% of them use the revenue tables, revenue splits, okay. installment splits, all of those, those tables. And the amount of effort required to port, I understand, is linked to the complexity of 
of the table joins and yeah. within the select statements and within the SQL. But one, one thing that's completely unknown to us right now is the amount of effort per customization required for a single uh, sort procedure that contains six tables or revenue-related tables, for example. What is the effort to port those? Is it really just changing the names to the FDM table names um, in the select statement as well as in the joins, or is it more complicated than that? Do we have to review every bit of recursive SQL in there? I, I just don't have an idea as to what an effort is, this is yet. So, Ellie, and this is, this is Brandon again, and also a, a very good question and, and somewhat of a difficult one to answer because, again, it, it's somewhat relative to what that SQL is, right? Um, you know, uh, for reporting, I think the overall effort tends to be a little bit easier because we're strictly dealing with, with a select versus, um, you know, a, a maybe a, an, ad, an ad form or an edit form where we're doing an insert maybe into those revenue tables. So the, the first thing I think I would probably say is if you're just looking at reads, I think you're automatically going to see a little bit less of an effort versus customizations that may do inserts, edits, deletes, or, or updates to those particular tables, right? So I think that's the, the first kind of, kind of way to look at it is what, what kind of actions am I taking against these previous revenue model tables versus um, what, might, what kind of change do I need to do? Uh, so that, that, I think that's the, the number one thing to bear in mind. Uh, number two is, you know, once again, it, it, it's also somewhat dependent on what you're doing. So if you've got a scenario where you're just doing um, you know, maybe some general, you know, gift detail where you're just doing some select statements out of the revenue table. Um, you won't necessarily, you won't necessarily want to just simply swap out the the revenue table name and maybe revenue split for the the FTM ones. Um, you may have to do a little bit of footwork to go from financial transaction to the revenue extension model. But generally speaking, you're not going to be looking at um, doing a whole lot of changes to your SQL. It's primarily going to be just around those table names. So, and you're also primarily only looking at just four. You're looking at, again, generally speaking, you're going to be looking at financial transaction, financial transaction light item, the revenue extension table, and the revenue split extension table. So you're not dealing with a very large number of tables to change. That was one of the intentional purposes was to make sure we're, we're lessening the number of tables that we've got. Um, so that, that by itself gives you a little bit of an indication of what you're, what you're also doing. Um, finally, I, I, would, I would also recommend that before you start thinking about, you know, what, what kind of level of impact you've got, I'd say take a look at some of this information out on the, the developer side about what the new structure looks like. Um, it, at first, I think some folks, um, you know, it, as with anything, as you initially go through and make some changes um, and you alter any SQL that you've got, it's going to become easier as you get down. So if you've got a high number of SQL you need to alter, um, by the time you get to the end, I think your, your, your time per artifact, if you will, um, will be will be much lower. It, it, as you get into it, I think you'll find that the structure makes a lot more sense. So there's there is certainly a little bit of a learning curve, but once you're over that hump, I think you're going to find that they'll they'll the developers who are making those changes will be much much easier and in a better place to make those changes than they were originally. So it, again, it's it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer. Um, it kind of just depends on what's being done and what's there. The fact that you've got reports, um, I think, is an indicator that you probably aren't looking at a whole lot of time, maybe just an hour or two per artifact. Um, as you get into some testing, you might find that just depending on where you are and what you're doing, you might not need to make those updates, just depending on the criticality, the importance, and the performance. Does that help answer your question? Oh, it definitely does. Thank you for that. Okay. We do have yeah, I, um, a couple dozen custom batches, so that, okay. that would be writing uh, as That's well. That's exactly as it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably put, I'd probably plan on more time for that, Ellie. I think that that just kind of makes sense. Um, but I will say though that you know, again, once once you dive into it, and you get over a little bit of that 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 learning curve. Um, I think the more simplified structure is going to be a lot easier. So you know, just the fact that we're going from 15, 18 odd tables down to four or five, I think gives you an indication that the process shouldn't be terribly difficult. But to be honest with you, though, there is a little bit of a learning curve, especially for some clients that are in the shoes that you guys are in where you've been using that model for a very long time. A couple of people have sent me questions that I'm going to follow up on. Um, so you will be getting a Q&A document from me. Um, 
And here on this last slide, you've got our contact information. But definitely, if you're ready to start looking at upgrading an environment or get going with this, your TAM is going to be your first point of contact. They've all seen and heard this presentation, so they know exactly what you've been hearing here um, and can help you kick off this process. Um, if nobody has any more questions, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. I hope that this was helpful, um, and we will be in touch with you soon with our, our next installment of our Upgrade webinar series. Thank you all.